All right, I may uh, call us to order here. Uh, my name is Joshua Eisenman. I'm an assistant professor at the LBJ School of Public Affairs, uh, senior fellow for China Studies at a place called the American Foreign Policy Council in Washington. Uh, it is my great pleasure to be the moderator for this panel um, and to thank uh, uh, William Bowden, Bobby Chesney, the Strauss Center, and the Clement Center uh, for hosting this great event. Um, we have a very distinguished panel, so I'm not going to go into anything except for introducing them and turn the stage right over. Um, uh, first, um, uh, at the end, uh, we have uh, Admiral Samuel Locklear, 39-year uh, veteran of the U.S. Navy, uh, uh, former commander of U.S. Pacific Command, commander of U.S. Naval Forces in Europe and Africa, commander of NATO Allied Forces, um, and as the commander of U.S. Uh, PAC Command, uh, he commanded all U.S. military forces operating across half the globe. He is one of the key architects of America's rebalance strategy in the Asia Pacific. Uh, he provided the vision, a strategic framework, and detailed planning um, that began that initiative in the Asia Pacific. Um, next to him, uh, we have uh, Dennis Wilder, a uh, senior official in the CIA and currently deputy assistant director in the newly created East Asia Pacific Mission Center. And we're going to begin by asking him to tell us a bit what that mission center does. Uh, from 2004 to 2009, he served on the National Security Council as the uh, China director and then as special assistant to the president and senior director for East Asian Affairs. Um, next to him, uh, we have my, my good friend and mentor, Randy Shriver. Uh, he, uh, Randy has three jobs. Uh, one is uh, uh, being a founding partner at Armitage International. He's the CEO and president of the Project uh, 2049 um, as senior associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. He also was the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and Pacific Affairs, where under his uh, portfolio was China, Taiwan, Mongolia, Hong Kong, uh, et cetera. Um, and finally, last but not least, uh, to my right uh, is Ashley Tellis, a Senior Associate at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington. Uh, he served on the National Security Council um, as a special assistant to the president and senior director for strategic planning for Southwest Asia. So as you can see, we have a very uh, prestigious panel here. So, uh, you know, as we've done in the past, uh, each panelist is going to have about 10 to 12 minutes to make their remarks. I would ask that um, uh, the, the, the chancellor's recent comments uh, over lunch uh, can maybe be food for thought for some of those comments. Um, and then uh, I will abuse the prerogative of the chair to ask the first question and then turn it over uh, to y'all. So. Thank you very much. Uh, Admiral Locklear, perhaps you can start us off. Well, thank you, Josh, and uh, thanks to the Clemens Center for hosting this conference and, and allowing me to participate, particularly with my esteemed colleagues up here, which I've come to know and respect. Um, Chancellor McRaven, I guess that's what I call him. I've called him uh, Admiral most of his, most of my, my time that I work with him. He and I are great friends, have been for a long time. Um, he introduced me at, at lunch to someone at the table. He said, this is Sam Locklear. He probably knows as much about China as anybody, anybody there is out there. And, uh, and I thought about that, and I thought, well, if, that's, if he really believes that, that's a pretty sad statement. <laughs> um, but I think it's, it's indicative of, um, of um, uh, what we need to do here as we go forward. And I'm really happy Clemens Center is doing this, is to get uh, our refocused on Asia, and in particular, U.S. interests as they relate to Asia. And sometimes we get that focused directly on China. But for me, uh, in my uh, oversight of the, the Pacific AOR, I had to continue to look at China as a member of a system or a portion of a system. And I think that that's important that we not lose context of how they fit into that overall system. But let me just share a couple of my personal, personal perspectives after, do, after dealing with this for a number of years. Uh, first, China is a very complex uh, and a, con a country that has significant challenges, both internally ex and externally. Uh, it, there are a, a lot of contradictions inside of China that will have to be answered over time. I think it's a general opinion of most everybody in the world that, it's, that the rise of China is inevitable. Uh, in fact, uh, most people in the world, I think even in this country, would agree that their successful rise in a peaceful nature where they contribute in the global economic system and to the security architecture of the world is in the best interest of the globe uh, because of their size and because of, uh, of who, the, how, who and how they operate, a failure in China internally would be catastrophic. I mean, catastrophic on a scale I think that we most of us haven't even contemplated. 
Uh, they actually think, if you think about China, I think you first should first think about them on a global scale, uh, which they are emerging globally, particularly in the economic sphere, and they're starting to move around. You see the little droppings of the Chinese uh, influence everywhere you go in the world today. Every uh, my counterparts that were combatant commanders would call me and say, hey, I just guess what I just saw in Africa or just what I saw in, in, in uh, South America or Central America. And so globally, there is an impact. I think the U.S. relationship with China on a global perspective has many uh, interesting dimensions to it, uh, particularly as they uh, assume a greater role in uh, U.N. deliberations or in uh, treaty developments or in nuclear uh, proliferation initiatives, which they are all kind of stepping forward to do. Uh, I think there is a general sense among some that at the global scene that they believe that China is a free rider at this point in time, that they have the potential to do more in global issues than they are willing to step forward and do. But now let's take it back to where I saw them, which was in a regional nature of where they are kind of the big guy on the block in most of what you would consider uh, Asia. Uh, but my observation was is that uh, if you look back over time, they are a walled-in country. Uh, so they're walled into the north by uh, the great uh, cold plains of Mongolia. Uh, the Himalaya Mountains wall them off between India and have been a source of concern between those two nations for, for centuries and probably will continue to be for centuries. Uh, to the south, they have the Southeast Asian countries, which are some, in, some are, are tribute countries, you would say historically of China, and some are not. Their sea space, quite limited. So if you look at the Yellow Sea and the South China Sea, this is a sea space, which from their particular view, they would say that that's like our Gulf of Mexico, and that's their access to the global maritime uh, economic uh, supply chains that really support the global economy today. So they're walled in. Even the fact they built the Great Wall of China, and if you look at their cities, their old cities, and their homes are even are built so that the walls are on the outside and the families live on the inside in a very unique kind of way. They still have about a half a billion or plus people that have to come out of the peasantry. Uh, their economic growth is fueling uh, not only uh, ability to bring those people out of peasantry, but it's bringing with it all those frustrating things like environmental issues and pollution that are going to have to be dealt with. Um, my sense is that they feel very much victimized of, by the past. So when you're a, if you read a lot about China and their, their historic, uh, how they got to, to the Cultural Revolution, which took them into the 70s. In fact, when I came in the Navy, they were still in their Cultural Revolution in the 70s. Most of the leaders that I dealt with inside of China, on the military and the civilian side, had all spent time on the, on the camps or on the farms during, during the revolutions. They have a really unique view of, of, of the China, the China system, and how they got to where they are today. So they're really emerging very rapidly from isolations of decades, um, and they've done, done that in the last four decades. And, and I'd say that on some counts, they've done a pretty good job managing that. I mean, the size and complexity of what they have to do. Um, they are doing that also under, uh, I made the mistake one time of sitting with the Chinese and saying, well, you know, you're a, a communist um, um, dictatorship, and, and they both all looked at me in the room and went, well, that's not true. I said, well, what are you? And they said, well, we really are an authoritarian bureaucracy. Uh, it, which, the uh, more you think about it, that's kind of what they are. So that they're even their own form of government. We think about it being a communist country with a Marxist. In fact, I kind of, uh, I kind of uh, think about uh, good California wine when I think about China. You know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great form of uh, authoritarian bureaucracy with oaky overtones of Marxism. <laughs> And Maoism, you know, a hint of Maoism on the aftertaste. And so, and so it depends on what, how long that wine ages is how you end up thinking about them. Bim. President Xi, um, I met him. He's an imposing figure. Uh, I think that, uh, 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 that he may, you know, it's, the, the jury is still out on how President Xi's time, the 10 years he'll be in position, will end up, and whether that will be the the fundamental change, changes allowed that, that brings China to realize their ultimate goal, which is a, a great power status that restores them to kind of preeminence that they, that they believe they had in the past by the middle of this century. But I would caution you to think about President Xi not like President Obama or President Bush or, or, 
or the, one of our presidents. He's really not like that. Uh, he is a, uh, a member of a body of, of seven now. Uh, he happens to be the head of it, and he is, and he is quite uh, out front. But uh, when he goes home at night, uh, he doesn't go back to the White House and, and deal like President Obama does. He has to go back into that group of seven and has to reach consensus among those. So it, it makes things, I, I think, my observation, it makes things in dealing with China uh, have to happen at a slower, more deliberate pace than you might see, might think of in our own country. Uh, their military is in a, a stage of huge reformation. Uh, it was designed primarily with a large army to, to do internal security. Uh, you know, when I first started sailing around the South China Sea as a young uh, military or Navy officer, uh, the, the best you could say about the, the Chinese Navy was that it was a, a third world, low end kind of capability, which we didn't worry about too much about. But as China has started to realize its regional and global aspirations, that's changing, and I think that they're you can see significant investments in that. You can also see President Xi taking a very much uh, more firm control of the military than what we observed in the past. And you can also see that he's recognized that corruption that was systemic in that organization has to be crushed out. And we've seen a lot of change in his, the time he's been uh, the president in making that happen. Um, so they are frustrated, though. And they'll tell you they're frustrated because they feel like that now that they have re-emerged after their cultural revolution, that, that they're emerging into a world where they were unable to set the rules or to even participate in those rules being set. And they look around, they say, well, who set the rules? Well, clearly in Asia, the U.S. set the rules. Post-World War II architectures, a series of alliances that were put into place, even the economic structures that permeate throughout that have allowed the economic miracles to happen in Asia were a, a product of U.S. involvement and U.S. structures there. Uh, the rule of law and, the, and those things that, that are uh, allowing uh, countries to survive over there and do well and democracy to be formed were put in place by U.S. Uh, engagement. But at the strategic level, there's a problem. So the Chinese, for them to emerge, and for them to come into the, the world in a way that they see that would benefit the Chinese people, and they are generally transactional people, which I find, which is uh, not a bad thing. I mean, you, they're, they don't hide things from you. They kind of tell you how they feel about it. Um, they have to pursue a strategy of change. Things have to change for them to realize their strategic objectives, both regionally and globally. The U.S., on the other hand, and the U.S. and our al al alliance structures we are pursuing a strategy of status quo because we like the way things are. We like the alliances that we have. We like the security architecture. We like the U.S. footprint there. And these are things that these, this strategy of, of, of change versus status quo can't exist in the same sphere with each other. There has to be something happen. There is going to be friction between there, and then the decision point is where does that friction occur? And I think you can see that playing out now in places like the uh, East China Sea, between the Chinese and the Japanese, and over the Senkaku, Daiyu Islands. And you can see it playing out in the South China Sea as well. So um, where else will it play out? Well, I think that one thing we haven't deliberated much on in this conference is North Korea and the implications of a failed North Korea or the implications of a reunited peninsula and the implications of how the Chinese will play in that and how the Chinese will play and juxtapose to how the U.S. will react to it as well, which I think has to be given a lot of serious thought. Um, today in the East China Sea, uh, as I mentioned, um, I think where you are today in that case is that we are at a, uh, a dangerous uh, strategic equilibrium there. Uh, I believe that uh, between the Chinese and the Japanese that they will probably be in this position of, of countering and positioning for some time, but uh, if we keep our fingers crossed, it'll probably stay pretty stable. South China Sea, I would not say that that same uh, equilibri equilibrium exists today. So the question, and we can talk more about it later if you want, in the South China Sea is what are those things that need to be put into place to restore equilibrium? Because the Chinese strategy of change is clearly apparent in the South China Sea and is clearly disrupting our uh, strategy of retaining status quo. 
Um, cyber, uh, cyber has been a place where I think we have uh, both felt uh, uh, more compelled to be uh, at each other between the U.S. and the Chinese, and um, uh, yet to be determined how we will work that out. We are continuing to have dialogue, but that dialogue is slow and laborious. The same can be said for space. And then I think the, the final thing I would say about on the military side is the nuclear deterrent. Uh, we know that uh, China has recently modernized or in the process of modernizing their nuclear deterrent. Uh, and this will have uh, significant implications for uh, this U.S. president and follow-on U.S. administrations about what we do with our own nuclear deterrent because it does add another, another level to it. Um, let me uh, kind of finish up here by saying I think that uh, the area that, that kind of steps outside the military realm, which I have observed the most, is the issue of getting our trade uh, issues, our trade and economic house in order in Asia. So, you know, we're on the, we're maybe in the position to get the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, in position, and I know that's quite controversial politically in this country. But what you happened in Asia is that for many years you had a security architecture that was that was primarily aligned under U.S. Uh, strategic objectives, and you had an economic architecture that laid over the top of it. And that's a good thing. You know, when the, your security is aligned around your pocketbook, you're in pretty good shape, right? But what's happened over time is that the security architecture has remained U.S.-centric throughout Asia, but the economic architecture has drifted, and it's drifted over primarily to a... Uh, to, a, to a, a PRC, a Chinese architecture, that where they kind of call the shots in many of these countries in Asia. So for us to remain relevant in Asia in the long run, which I think our children, our grandchildren would be disadvantaged if we don't, we got to bring that back together. So we have to work on the economic end as well as the, as well as the military end. So let me stop there and uh, thanks for letting me make those comments. Great, uh, thank you, Admiral. Uh, Mr. Wilder, you Thanks. can tell Thanks us whether the wine will turn to vinegar. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually have uh, a different uh, viewpoint here on Chinese Communist Party that um, I want to elucidate. But first, let me say on the uh, Chancellor's remarks today, I think they were uh, right on target. Um, but I would also say the the complexity of the world today means that we can't just concentrate on the Middle East. That if we put all our resources and all our energy in dealing with the ISIL situation, which we have to deal with, and neglect East Asia, we will, we will deal with the tactical and neglect the strategic. And so I uh, just admonish you that I wish the world were simple enough that we could take on one challenge at a time, but this is a world uh, that is highly complicated, and there are a lot of challenges that we're going to be dealing with all at the same time. Uh, I do come from the CIA, and I come from the East Asian Mission Center. Uh, that said, let me say that my remarks are my own and uh, not necessarily reflective of U.S. government policy. Um, I would also say that uh, to just explain the changes that are going on at CIA, in very brief terms, we've taken a page out of the military's book. The military went a few years ago to the combatant command structure. We like that structure. We think it has built a very, very solid military capability. And what we're trying to do now is move intelligence in the same direction so that on East Asia, all our resources on East Asia are together in one sort of common uh, grouping and we use the synergies of all of the different capabilities of the CIA against that particular uh, set of issues. Uh, so it's an exciting period, actually, of change for us. But let me go to China. And what I want to do is very quickly do what Leon Aaron did far more masterfully yesterday when he talked about Putin. What I want to talk about is what does the Chinese president, Xi Jinping, believe in? He has only been there for three years, and so he is not, was not a known quantity. In fact, when I went to Beijing with President Bush in 2008 uh, for the Olympics, the president was very excited about the Olympics. I was excited about meeting Xi Jinping because I thought there would be a great insight I could take home and I could, uh, you know, have dinner out on the subject of Xi Jinping for a good long time. Um, he was boring. 
in that meeting. He, was, he gave us absolutely nothing of interest. And the reason was he wasn't in power yet. And in the Chinese system, the tall nails always get hammered down. And so he was very, very cagey in his rise to the top. Consequently, we have only since 2012 seen what this man's agenda is. And let me go through a little bit of the agenda. First of all, um, what the Admiral said was true. A lot of Chinese did not believe in the Chinese Communist Party anymore. Well, he's going to change that. He says, and he has said it very clearly, I want a cleaner party. I want um, a party that is more disciplined. And I'm the man to do it. And what he has done has been remarkable. He has taken on every sector of the Chinese system in an anti-corruption campaign, the likes of which has never been seen in China before. He has taken on Politburo Standing Committee, members, he has taken on the children of the elite, and basically what had happened to the Communist Party over the years of Deng Xiaoping's to get rich is glorious, the Communist Party got rich, individually got rich. And what you saw was the erosion of what was the basis of China since 1949. How has he done this? I've talked about the uh, anti-corruption campaign. The other is that he has revived, revived the notion that there is a first among equals in the Politburo Standing Committee. In fact, you may argue that he's moving toward first and no equals. Um, the way he has done this is he's created five party leading groups which have taken over from the institutions of government. So there's a leading group on reform, and that he heads. There is a leading group on deepening reform in the military, these transitions he's trying to make. He heads that. There is a leading group on informationalization. In other words, how to use new digital media to get the message of the Communist Party apart, up, across. He is head of that group. He is head of the Finance and Economic Committee. I think you see a pattern here. <laughs> this man is, is taking the power back to the top of the Chinese system because he really did believe, and many in the party believed, that China was headed toward color revolution. That as the party weakened, and as power became more diffuse in the system, great danger was coming to the Chinese system. If you look at, and I'll just briefly say this, Bo Xi Lai, and the situation that developed with Bo Xi Lai in southern China, he was almost a warlord by the end of his period of control. And they had to do something about that. They were not going to let China fall apart. He believes he has the mandate of heaven. He believes that he, as the son of one of the founders of China, as a crown prince of China, they often call them in China, that he will bring China back to greatness. And that the 21st century is the century of China. This is a very popular view in, in China. I was on a uh, small boat uh, with a baker from Guangzhou sitting there, and we were talking. And he looked at me at one point and said, the last century was yours. This century is mine. That is a very real feeling among the Chinese people. And he is playing to that kind of nationalism. He's also doing a very interesting thing going beyond Mao. In other words, Mao's theories and, and Leninist doctrine was very effective, but it fell off in Chinese culture and society. It, it, it lost its resonance. He is now going back to the concepts of 5,000 years of Chinese history, and he is endorsing Confucius and Mengzi, and he is making himself into sort of the sage emperor, the, the, the benevolent leader with a lot of power who divvies out the goods and governs well. Now, the third thing I would say about what he believes is he believes that we want to bring him down, that we want to contain China, and ultimately, we want to destroy China. This has been ingrained in the Chinese culture for a great many years, 
and it continues to be there. We try very hard to explain to the Chinese that if we wanted to bring them down, why would we have traded the way we have with them? Why have we accepted them so well into the world? But somehow it doesn't resonate as well as it should. So when they see things like the TPP, they say, ah, again, you're trying to leave us out of the trade situation in East Asia because China is not part of the TPP. Or when they see us, quote unquote, interfering in the South China Sea, well, you have no claim to any of these islands. Why would you be doing this? It must be because you still don't want us to be a strong, prosperous power. The President of the United States has really said this till he was blue in the face to the Chinese, and other presidents have as well. But it, it is deeply ingrained in the Chinese view, and it's very hard to get over. Let me do a couple of implications of this. First of all, President Xi Jinping is much bolder and much more assertive than the last two Chinese leaders. In that regard, he, in the South China Sea, has taken a much more aggressive stance than we might have expected out of his predecessors. I think, frankly, he's taken a page out of Putin's book. He has seen there were opportunities because of the distractions, perhaps, of the United States and other areas. Um, also, he held a meeting with the leader of Taiwan on November 7th. That was a surprise to everybody. I would submit to you, I think it was a, uh, a surprise to the foreign ministry of China and many of his own people. This is a man who's making decisions within a small inner circle. So what's good about that? Well, there are a couple things that are very good for us. One is if you look at the climate change decisions the Chinese made, what they will take to Paris, this is a very good step. It is a very good direction on carbon emissions. Secondly, um, we have gotten a very interesting agreement with the Chinese on cyber, a controversial agreement, but it is the first time the Chinese have acknowledged that there is a problem on the cyber side, that Chinese company or Chinese entities have been involved in espionage against the United States in commercial sense. So he is a leader we can work with in that regard. I think the dangers of Xi Jinping are really that his boldness internally and the way he wants to take China is actually at fundamental odds with some of what China needs to do. If you think about the information age, if you're going to take power back up to the center, and you're going to control all the media, how do you get the entrepreneurial spirit going? How do you create the commerce you need to make in China? Um, I also think that we, don't, we shouldn't think about talking about this man as a 10-year ruler. He has talked about quite openly that the Mao Zedong era lasted 30 years, the Deng Xiaoping era lasted 30 years. What comes next? I think you might be able to figure out where his thinking is going on that. Um, so I think that we are at a very interesting point, and I'll say one more thing on the economic side. The stock market crash in Shanghai this, month, this summer was very instructive about Xi Jinping and how he's trying to operate. On the one hand, the Chinese told everybody and their brother in China to get into the stock market. It was a great thing. The government said, look at that market. It's going up like gangbusters. We all need to be part of this. When it crashed, the Chinese government said, whoa, wait a minute. We'd better intervene. And so rather than let market forces operate, which is frankly what they should have done, they intervened heavily. And thus, what we see is a cognitive dissonance between the desire to move China former forward. I think he is an economic reformer, but this emphasis he has on party control is at odds with a lot of the rest of the agenda of China. I'll leave it there. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, having me to the University of Texas, the Clement Center, and the, the Strauss Center, and um, enjoyed the, the presentations. Uh, thus far, a great deal. I hope I can hold up that high standard. I know we're 
somewhat judged by the company we keep. I know my reputation is enhanced today sitting alongside uh, these guys, Admiral Locklear and, and Dennis and Ashley. And Josh was kind to say that I was a uh, mentor. Well, let me tell you, the uh, student more often than not is teaching the teacher these days. Josh is really one of the uh, rising stars and, and one of the bright lights in our China field. And I hope we get the benefit of his insights as, as we go forward through this panel. Um, so among other things, as Josh mentioned, I run a, a small institute called Project 2049, and we're staffed with, with Chinese linguists and people who were trained in the intelligence community, maybe not to Dennis's standard, but people who had experience uh, in the intel world. And um, we try to understand what's going on in China and what's happening in the Asia Pacific region. And um, I'm going to divulge some intellectual property here. I know I'm, this is perhaps sacrificing some IP that's critical to our success going forward, but I'm going to let you know how we do it anyways. So we have a very sophisticated technique. We read what they write, we listen to what they say, and we watch what they do. <laughs> and to me, if you read what they write, listen to what they say, watch what they do, there are a, a few things that are uh, so incredibly clear uh, without, in my mind, any ambiguity uh, that we somehow still seem to, to miss or at least have questions about. And, and let me tell you what we're observing. Uh, in my mind, there's absolutely no question, no question that the Chinese view us as a strategic rival and believe they are embarked upon long-term strategic competition with us for as far as the eye can see. There's no question in my mind about that. Um, now, I don't mean to sound hyperbolic or, or alarmist in any way. I think we can still have a relationship that avoids conflict, military conflict, and is benign in that sense. We can still find areas of cooperation where our interests overlap. But I think we shouldn't be naive about uh, the kind of relationship that China is currently seeking. You know, maybe over time, we can shape their calculus, shape their impressions of us, build trust, but I don't think we should be naive about how they view us now and what their goals and objectives are. So if you look at what they're, what they're saying and what they're writing, um, you know, sometimes I think the Chinese really benefit a great deal and, and count on the fact that not many Americans read Chinese or speak Chinese because the way they talk about us is pretty shocking. Um, they have no qualms about using terms like enemy number one in their uh, military journals. Um, now, militaries, that's what arguably they do. They prepare for contingencies, worst case scenarios. But uh, if you're under the impression there's ambiguity there, there's, there's not. Uh, we are enemy number one for them. Uh, they do talk very openly. Uh, about how the U.S. is containing, constraining, you know, whatever objective truth is, and I think Dennis uh, was absolutely correct in, in talking about how Xi Jinping views these things. So they're writing these things, they're saying, you know, look at, what are they saying? You look at Xi Jinping's uh, speech at the SICA conference, the Asian, Asia for Asians, and Josh has done a lot of work on this and held panels on this. It wasn't a single speech of Xi Jinping that the foreign ministry then had to come and clean up and say what the general secretary really meant was it's, it's a consistent theme throughout public remarks, uh, particularly in Chinese language, particularly to Chinese audiences. So I think uh, Admiral Locklear made a very important point about what we're really up against. So we have a policy which is essentially sustain the status quo, or I would even argue the, the rebalance or the pivot is, is maybe even doubling down. Um, we're saying our alliances are more important. We're saying we're going to look for new partners and help build capacity. We're going to pursue trade liberalization at a much more robust uh, uh, level with the high quality standard agreement that we have in TPP. So we're, we're at, at a minimum status quo, but I would say perhaps even doubling down, whereas the Chinese have a very different view of the future security architecture for the region, which is Asia for Asians, which means a Chinese-led regional security order. Um, now, to me, that means they're trying to revise the status quo. There's no question about it. And to me, that means we're going to be faced with some choices, some policy choices. Um, I don't think it's any coincidence 
that rather than investing more in the Asia Development Bank or the World Bank or the IMF, that they're out there creating the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank or that they're out there talking about One Belt, run, One Road. These are Chinese-led initiatives that are uh, under the control of, of Chinese decision makers. Um, it is outside the framework we established. So there is, a, I, I would argue, a great deal of tension between the order that we helped create and the order that they aspire to. And I think there is, it is correct to say that probably no country in Asia has benefited more from the security architecture and the economic architecture that we helped establish along with like-minded countries in Asia. Uh, but there's probably no country today that is more profoundly uncomfortable with it than China. So they have benefited from it. They've excelled, uh, I think, uh, principally because of it. Uh, but they aspire to something very different. Now, that's only part of the story. I think it's also really important to understand the drivers, and I really appreciate uh, both Admiral Locklear and, and um, Dennis's remarks, because I think the drivers also help us understand uh, how we should respond and how we should uh, craft our own uh, strategy to try to implement the vision that we're articulating, the, the so-called rebalance. Um, and I think there's a tendency to uh, mirror image a little too much and talk too much about, I'm, I'm stealing uh, some of Josh's uh, ideas here from a previous conversation, uh, talk about things in terms of IR theory and a rising power versus a status quo power, because I think a lot of the drivers are internal and have to do with an overall approach that Xi Jinping has adopted for sustaining the Communist Party, sustaining his own leadership. And I agree with, with Dennis's analysis very much. He has embarked very aggressively uh, down that road. Nationalism will become increasingly important, uh, but it's a particular kind of nationalism. You know, everybody has their, their patriotism or nationalism, and every country is guilty of that in, in uh, one form or another. But the Chinese nationalism is of a, of a particular kind. It, it is based on victimization. It is based on being the aggrieved party for two centuries. And when they talk about Japan and history and, and um, uh, uh, the 70 year anniversary and, and the, the remarkable events we, we witnessed, the big parade in Beijing, um, there's a reason for that beyond commemorating what happened, beyond trying to urge the Japanese to fully and, and forthrightly take responsibility for past deeds. When your nationalism is based in victimization, you have to sustain and keep that victimization fresh in everyone's mind. And it turns out it's horribly inconvenient that for the last 70 years, Japan has been an absolute great partner to China in terms of its foreign direct investment, in terms of its overseas development assistance, in terms of its uh, uh, military posture and, and its respect for the constraints of Article 9, that's terribly inconvenient when you want to be uh, a, a country that stokes nationalism through this victimization lens. So understanding these drivers, I think, is a, a critical part of this because ultimately what really matters is, is what we do about it, right? And there are different schools of thought here. I, I would say, and I'd be curious, uh, Dennis's view and Josh's view on this, I mean, I would say, in a way, China policy is being debated for the first time in my professional life in, in, a, in a real robust way where you have different camps who, who really disagree on some of the fundamentals of our approach. There's a real uh, unraveling of the consensus. I think before, whether it was Republican, Democrat, whether you were slightly more hawkish, slightly more dovish, People had the notion that the, the policy had to be some blend of engagement and hedging, and maybe on the margins we can tweak the engagement, tweak the hedging, but that overall a couple of assumptions that we all held were going were gonna to play out. And, and I think those assumptions themselves are highly flawed, if not completely uh, uh, without truth. And, the assumptions I'm talking about, engagement of China, positive interaction with China will help reform, promote reform in China and engender a desire to liberalize, to include political liberalization. Number two, drawing China out into the region, into the international system, into uh, global concerns 
will have the effect that China will see itself as a stakeholder, an equity holder, and will over time behave more responsibly, re behave more constructively. I certainly uh, believe those things, and I certainly was a party to policies that were founded on those assumptions when I was at the Pentagon in the mid-90s. These were our mantras. We need China to participate in multilateral fora. We need China to, to participate in these various regional organizations because surely, once they're at the table, they will see the equities involved and they will behave more constructively and responsibly. Well, I would argue both assumptions, as I said, are at a minimum flawed, but, but probably uh, uh, completely discredited. Uh, China is not reforming politically. It's, it's, it's engaged in serious backsliding uh, in terms of trying to strengthen the hand of the party in terms of uh, human rights, religious freedom, internet freedom. Um, it's all well documented. Um, uh, you can see what they're doing with house churches and, and uh, with respect to how people use social media. Uh, I think it's pretty clear there's a back, backsliding there and an attempt to reinforce the rule of the party. And of course, this question about are they behaving more constructively, are they behaving more responsibly, I think if you look at many of the things that, that Admiral Locklear talked about, East China Sea, South China Sea, um, uh, some of their development habits in uh, other areas such as the African continent, I think arguably they're not. So what do we do about that? Um, I think, as I said, there is a genuine debate underway. There is. I think, a voice for more accommodation, that the real problem is this issue of lack of trust. China does see us as an enemy. They do believe we're trying to contain them. And we haven't been able to persuade them thus far that we're not doing that. We just got to try harder. And we got to particularly look at some of the areas that they describe as core interests. So uh, there, is, there is a voice that says we should change our policy on Taiwan. There's an asymmetry of interest. They care a lot more than we do. Um, perhaps they're headed in the direction of reconciliation anyways. Why don't we get ahead of that curve and get credit from the Chinese rather than be the last holdout? Um, and, and generally this view, uh, is, they pull that thread far, far enough and there's a belief we could head towards some sort of G2 or some sort of more collaborative management of regional and global affairs. That's one thought. I think there's another thought that endorses kind of a muddling through and buying time either because we don't have any better ideas and that this blend of, of engagement and hedging is the worst of all policies except all others tried, and that you know we can tweak on the margins as necessary and we're doing about as best as we can and we're not going to war and you know we can sort of live with that. Um, there is another part of that same school that says we should muddle through because China just might not make it. Um, their internal problems, whether that's the environment, whether it's the corruption that they aren't fully getting their hands around despite the efforts of Xi Jinping, um, that uh, uh, ethnic tension, uh, all these problems, that the fact that they might get old before they get rich, this demographic issue that they have, which is not uncommon in Asia, but theirs is weirder because they have this gender imbalance. Um, so there's that school, and then there's a school that thinks that, no, we really have to be on a footing for uh, strategic competition. And again, that's not to say you can't find cooperation in such an environment, but that we have to think differently about how we approach issues like the South China Sea, how we think about our mill-to-mill -mill relationship, and, and so on and so forth. I've got views on that, but I'll just leave that out there on the table as, as the different schools of thought that, that I hear. And I, I do think you know, on discrete issues, we'll be challenged on this uh, more and more. And we re really will have to decide how we're going to orient ourselves. I think um, a year from now, and this is not at all fishing for an invitation, Will, to come back and speak, but <laughs> I think we're going to be in a very different place in the Taiwan Strait. Uh, I don't blame Tsai Ing-wen. I don't blame the DPP. I blame the fact that the Chinese are profoundly uncomfortable with democracy in Taiwan and that at some level they understand that their policy has been a horrible failure. That despite all the cross-strait trade deals, despite all the people-to-people -people exchanges, there are more people in Taiwan who want eventual independence, status quo now, yes, but eventual independence than ever before. The number of people who want eventual independence is over half, and the people who want eventual unification after the status quo is almost, uh, it's, it's, it's approaching 
uh, almost nil. It's uh, single digits, uh, to be sure. So their policy is failing. Remember, the Chinese don't want status quo in perpetuity. The Chinese want unification. And what they've done so far hasn't worked. So Tsai Ing-wen and the DPP may just be a very convenient excuse to turn up, uh, ratchet up the tension and resort to more coercive tools while trying to engage us in a program of co-management of Taiwan and get us to put pressure on Tsai. So you can invite me back and we'll see how I did on the <laughs> prediction. But I think, um, I think that, that some of these discrete issues are going to come to the fore more quickly than any of us want and, and we'll be tested. And this is where I think, uh, I guess I'll close on, on the invitation to comment on the Chancellor's remarks. Uh, to me, it's, it's on the mark, but I also feel like uh, it's Groundhog Day, you know, that movie. As an Asianist, as a, as a China specialist, you know, just when we get people's attention, just when we, we get a policy, we get sucked back into the Middle East. And um, the, uh, the most valuable resources in Washington, it's not money, it's not military equipment, it's not any of these things. It's the time and attention of your senior most leaders in government to include the president and the secretaries of state and defense. We've certainly lost that for the time being. And... Um, uh, hopefully we'll recapture that as a, as a person who agrees with Dennis that, that uh, although there are important things going on in the Middle East, the strategic challenge that China is presenting is really the challenge of our time. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Let me start, uh, as others have done, by thanking Will and Bobby for the invitation. It's wonderful to be back here in Austin. Uh, let me start by arguing the proposition that, uh, that Randy just left off with, because I fully concur with what he said. Uh, we are in the earliest stages of a long-drawn strategic competition with China. But the important thing from my point of view is that we have brought the situation about as a consequence of our own strategy. That is the irony, I think, of how the international system has evolved. And there is a moral hidden here which should remind us that even our greatest successes often contain the seeds of their own undoing. When we set out to integrate China into the global system after 1971, we did so on the assumption that China would join the liberal international order in much the same way that all our other Asian allies did between 1945 and 1971. And we started out on the assumption that that integration would be important in terms of enabling China to grow, but it would have fundamentally no impact on global politics. That is, there would be no consequential change in the global balance of power as a result of China's integration into the international system. And therefore, we could champion that integration, as Randy identified, actually with clear-throated conviction. Because if at the end of the process, you had a more prosperous China, a more democratic China, and a more cosmopolitan China, what's to lose? You end up with a win-win across the international system. And the United States preserves itself as the system leader, and the Asian system then becomes an avenue for greater peace and greater prosperity, both of which were put in place as a result of a massive expenditure of American blood and treasure during the Second World War. Except that this time it was different, because we ended up strengthening a country that was not like just any other country in Asia. First, China is a true candidate great power. It's a continental-sized state with enormous latent capacities. It's not a South Korea. Still less is it a Philippines. The second, this is a country with a chip on its shoulder. Once upon a time, China was the center of the Asian universe. The entire Asian geopolitical system revolved around Chinese primacy. So it should not be surprising that when a country like this comes out of a 500-year-old funk, 
It really seeks to reestablish the primacy that it once enjoyed and which remains the political reference point for its engagement with the international system. And to make things worse, this country was a very odd country because of the character of its state-society relations. It's a Leninist state which seeks to control a market society. And that, all put together, ended up with China pursuing goals that should come as no surprise to us. The effort to assert the primacy of the party within its own polity, and the effort to assert the primacy of the country within the region in which it is located. The last 30 odd years have been great for China because the American effort to integrate it into the global international order essentially gave it asymmetric access to Western markets, to Western technology, and even Western capital. It permitted a three decade long period of sustained economic growth that has absolutely no parallel in human history. Never has a country grown at double digit rates for more than 15 years. China beat the system and grew for over 30 years at those rates. By itself, this should not pose a problem to the United States. Double digit growth rates to the degree that they bring people out of poverty, give them a chance to enjoy a good life. That's the essence of our liberal vision of politics. What complicates the story in the case of China was that good economics was only a foundation for more assertive strategy. And good economics has now gone beyond simply the effort to raise Chinese out of poverty and has moved decisively in the direction of a major military modernization, which is designed to change the regional balance of power to the disadvantage of China's neighbors, and more importantly, to prevent the United States from coming effortlessly to the defense of these neighbors in a crisis. So the real consequence of China's growth and its integration into the global system has really been that it has now put China in a position where it can effectively decouple the United States from its Asian creation. Because to the degree that China gradually acquires stronger and stronger capacities to deter the United States from intervening in China's aggressiveness vis-a-vis -vis its regional neighbors, to that degree, its regional neighbors have to contemplate the possibilities of essentially acquiescing to China's demands. And all our efforts going forward now have to struggle with how we manage this contradiction, which has been the product of the success of our own strategy. Unfortunately for us, this is not the only problem we have. As we heard today, we don't have the luxury of thinking of China to the exclusion of the rest of the world. We thought the problems of security competition in Europe were over. Guess what? They're back. We thought that we'd managed the problems of state fragility in the Middle East through our interventions. Guess what? They're back. And so the first challenge that we face is really strategic juggling of priorities, dealing with the threats posed by rising power at the same time when we cope with the threats posed by a declining but assertive power and the threats posed by essentially fragility and weakness spilling out of the regions in which they are inhabited. What makes things more complicated is that the US economy today, while certainly better in absolute terms than it was uh, many, many years ago, is still in relative terms performing less well than it should. And so this bears directly on the question of resources that the United States can commit to juggling these competing threats simultaneously. 
And there's a third problem, which actually is a structural one and hard to overcome. It's not that the United States doesn't know how to deal with rising competitors. Hell, we've been dealing with competitors of different kinds since uh, the birth of the Republic. But what makes this competition different is that we actually end up being deeply interdependent with the rival whose actions we seek to control. We didn't have this problem during the Cold War. The great advantage of the Cold War was that we had economic integration among friends, and we had economic autarky across blocks. So we could deal with the Soviet Union without having to worry about whether the Soviets could manipulate the economic relationship with the United States, because there was no economic relationship to manipulate. This is a problem that we have with China today, which is not susceptible to any easy solution. So as we go forward, what are the things that we have to do to salvage our position in the international system? I think the first transformation that we have to make is the transformation that Admiral Locklear, Dennis Wilder implicitly, and Randy emphasized. That is, we've got to think of China as something more than a strategic partner. We've got to think of it as a partner in some areas, and we need to keep the lines of cooperation open to sustain that partnership for whatever benefits it brings. But we have to be cognizant equally of the fact that there are things that China is going to do that are going to be deeply, deeply dangerous to our core interests. So we need essentially a gestalt switch to think of China in a different way. Second, there is no competition with China that can be won if we do not go back to looking seriously at rebuilding the foundations of our own economy. At the end of the day, this is a material struggle, and you don't have to be a Marxist to believe that. So we have to go back to look at those issues with respect to our own economy, rising debt burdens, flattening productivity, low labor force growth, and so on and so forth. Third, think seriously about the need to recapitalize our military forces. We cannot, and Admiral Locke can speak to this far more authoritatively than I can, we cannot win this competition in Asia if in word and deed and capacity we are unable to communicate to our allies that if the balloon goes up, the United States will not only be willing but actually be able to come to their defense with success. Nobody's interested in the United States that comes to their defense and loses. So we've got to be able to come there and successfully win in a limited war engagement because we are un highly unlikely that we are going to have the luxury of long-term mobilization and a protracted, open-ended military struggle that is kinetic. The fourth, and uh, Admiral Locklear flagged this. We need to think of re-engaging with the Asian economic architecture. Today, China's trade with its neighbors is far greater than the trade of the United States with any of its neighbors. And therefore, the need to look to, to new alternative trading arrangements like TPP is absolutely essential. Now, unfortunately for us, the TPP that has just been negotiated is not, in my book, a gold standard TPP. It's not a TPP that allows us to either maximize our economic advantages vis-a-vis -vis China, nor does it give us enough reasons to keep the Chinese out if that's what our policy requires us to do over the long term. I don't know how we fix this problem because now as a result of trade promotion authority, we have only up or down votes with respect to TPP. We don't have the capacity to amend the agreement. But we have to find creative ways of figuring out how to get engaged in the economic architecture. Next, we need to rebuild our alliances. And we need to rebuild our alliances not simply with our existing partners, but with other states that happen to be threatened by China. And there are two countries in particular that are very pivotal to my calculations. One is Vietnam and the other is India. And finally, we have to start thinking seriously and talking seriously about a very uncomfortable subject which we thought we left behind. 
And that is the future of technology controls with respect to rising racial powers. We had a great system during the Cold War. That system is atrophied for very understandable reasons. But if we do believe that there is a China on the horizon as a strategic competitor to the United States, then the question of how we gain the benefits of globalization on one hand while limiting its adverse consequences, particularly with respect to technology diffusion, is something that must preoccupy us in the years to come. Let me just end on one note. And this was implicit in the remarks that were made by others as well. Maintaining American primacy in Asia is extremely important, not just for Asian security, but ultimately for American security. There has been a geopolitical reason going back close to 200 years, why the United States always wanted to prevent the rise of local hegemonies in Europe and Asia. If we permit a local hegemony to arise today, we lose access to the most important center of gravity in the international system. And the only way to prevent that from happening is to make certain that American primacy is essentially reinforced, refurbished, and ready to rock and roll. To do that, we have to make hard choices. And I just want to end by saying, doing that is going to be expensive. There's no question. But losing that primacy will be even more expensive in ways that we cannot anticipate today. Thank you. Well, those are some excellent comments. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen. So I want to use my prerogative of the chair to ask a, a question here, which has, I guess, two sides. Um, Randy mentioned and others mentioned um, how for a long time, our strategy towards China has been engagement and hedging. And so the first part of my question is, how has China for so long been able to mollify US experts' concerns about China's rise? This isn't a new phenomenon, but somehow up until very recently, um, we've heard exactly as Randy has said, a uh, constant discussion of engagement and hedging and a little bit of this and a little bit of that. How has that happened for so long? And on the flip side of that, how have we who have been constantly saying to the Chinese that we do not wish to undermine their rise, how have we been so ineffective in getting them to accept that we do not actually wish to undermine them? And if we fail to assuage Chinese leaders' concerns on that regard, well then how can we reduce the possibility that China will use force to resolve its territorial claims? Just the easy question. Uh, maybe we could start with uh, Admiral. Would you like to start us off? Sure. <clears throat> Let me see if I got all the, that four-part question right there. <laughs> I've got two more parts. If you know. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we have been uh, very, uh, at the political level, at the diplomatic level, we've been very, try to be very clear to China that, that we weren't uh, in the business of trying to contain China. In fact, uh, I've said, hey, if we weren't really militarily contain you, we'd be doing different things, and we know how to do that. Uh, but it's not in the best interest because of the interconnectedness we have. This isn't like a Cold War scenario as was well described down here, where you have a, uh, you know, a, a Russia or a, a, you know, a Soviet Union that, that you are not connected with. It sits in its own little basket and it controls its part of the world. That's not true with the China, so it makes it, it much more complex. But I've also said uh, that containment is in the eyes of the beholder. Uh, I can't tell you if my actions around you make you feel contained or not. So if you look at it from the Chinese perspective, certainly we have a strategy of containment. Uh, you cannot argue with it because we want to contain them to move them into a system that, that's favorable to us. And they, don't, and they see that as containment. So they look at our, our, the, all of our alliances, which I agree are critical to the future and doubling down on those is important. They look at those as Cold War structures that, uh, that don't, serve, don't serve well the, the future of security architectures the way they see it uh, in, uh, in Asia. Um, so to the degree that, that, that this uh, feeling of containment makes them do things like the South China Sea uh, and makes them step out in that regard, um, 
and then, you know, I think it will. I mean, I think there's this inevitable. I mean, what happened in the South China Sea, I think we could have predicted 20 years ago would have happened. Uh, certainly, they, uh, if they believe they have a historic claim to those regions, they believe that, um, uh, that the legal system that has kind of kept them out of at this point in time is, is not, was developed by us and not in their favor. Uh, and so uh, they've been uh, patient about this, and suddenly and I think they have moved quickly to seize this opening. It might have been, uh, sometimes I wonder if it was the rapid movement in the last couple of years was in response to the uh, international tribunal that's being pursued by the Filipinos, and I think quite bravely by the Filipinos, because ultimately for us, we've said all along, we don't take sides on territorial disputes. We just want there to be no coercion. We want it to be done in a, uh, in a sense of, a, of a international rule, international law, and, and they all go figure it out. Because if you go to the South China Sea, who's ever looked at it, just lay down all the competing claims. I call it the South China Sea chicken soup. I mean, it is, it is unbelievable how they will ever work through this, not just China, but the other, the other uh, claimants that are in this area as they try to figure out who, who owns what but post uh, uh, unclose. So I think they made this move uh, uh, to position themselves uh, either uh, for us to back away or for the other countries to acquiesce, but also at the point in time where they have to answer the legal questions about the nine dash line claims, I think they want to be postured in a way that, that allows them to manage that dialogue better. And you know, the South China Sea is a big area. Uh, as much as these little rocks that were expanded in the media look to be a big deal, I think strategically they're a big deal. Uh, tactically, they're not a very big deal. Uh, they're not going to take over the South China Sea by having a couple of uh, a couple of fighters flying off a short runway uh, in a uh, down there. So, and in and in warfare, they know that those little islands just become targets that get evaporated within a couple of minutes after the war starts. So, but it, it's a, they're strategic issues uh, for them. I'm sorry. No, thank you, uh, Dennis. Do you want to? Yeah, I think um, an important point to be made here is uh, why have people started to look at China a little differently? Because China has overreached at too early a stage in sort of its rise. Let me, let me explain that a little bit. Um, the Chinese were very careful for a long time and very cautious in their behavior. The move into the South China Sea and the way they've uh, built up those islands, now 3,000 acres have been created uh, off the seabed. Um, this is something that uh, the Southeast Asians have s sat up and take notice of. And they now say, wait a minute, I thought you were joining the rules of the international community. And with this sort of move and the creation of an air defense identification zone in the East China Sea, the Chinese have sort of revived the China threat uh, in a way that it had receded. So, uh, and then I think in the cyber realm, we are not the only people in the world who have seen the Chinese come at them. The Chinese have come back at every nation uh, that they can possibly think of in the cyber area. And I think this has been a critical mistake on the Chinese part. Because what they've done is rather than uh, accept the international order, they are saying we want to reshape the international order to some of our rules. And so I, I think it is frankly the result of Chinese actions that people are now um, less sure that China is a status quo power. Just say uh, three quick things. Um, for the majority of the time we've been trying to implement this strategy, China didn't matter much. And it's the, it's the rapidity with which your comment about no country had achieved that rapid a rise and had that much success. I, I mean, I remember so clearly uh, the meeting that, that I participated in with Secretary Powell while all, where all of a sudden the, the meeting with his counterpart had 24 paragraphs to it because we were talking about Chinese peacekeepers in Haiti. We were talking about Somalia and what the Chinese were doing to arm the government in Khartoum that was then arming the John Jawi. It, it just struck me this relationship is so different than a relationship where you talk about four things over and over and over again. Um, so for most of the time, it, it, it really was not a major player as we were implementing this strategy, which ultimately turned out to be very beneficial to China. 
I think number two, um, we shouldn't forget while we're engaging them, they're engaging us. And the Chinese are masterful at it. If you've never, my, my uh, business partner Richard Armitage has, I'll clean it up a little bit. He has a saying which I'll try to clean up. If you've never been sucked up, if you think uh, sucking up to somebody doesn't work, you've never been sucked up to. Um, <laughs> And the Chinese are absolutely brilliant in their engagement strategy. And by the way, the, the amount that they invest to include up to today in political warfare, I mean, just that term doesn't sit well with a lot of Americans. It sounds sort of Cold War era, uh, uh, archaic. But uh, for the Chinese, how much they spend and invest in political warfare, maybe perception management, maybe that's a term people might be more comfortable with, uh, but the influence operations and what they're doing is uh, dramatic. And um, uh, they target the people that they think their, their in, in, opinions matter, their influence is important, and so on and so forth. That's the topic of another uh, discussion, I think. And then I agree with Dennis about overplaying their hand, but, but also, when did this we all sort of agree China has become more assertive, China's become more aggressive. When did this start? Roughly 2009, 2010, what was happening at that time? The global financial crisis, the worst relationship we'd had in modern history with Japan under the DPJ and the Hatayama bizarreness. Um, the election in Taiwan bringing stability uh, to the cross strait for the first time in a long time. China saw a window of opportunity. So it was, I agree, they ultimately overplayed their hands, but their literature was filled with this notion of strategic opportunity, window of opportunity. They really thought the global financial crisis was gonna put us on our back heels and change the, the power hierarchy, perhaps uh, in a permanent way. And I think they did miscalculate and they did overplay their hand. Thank you. Uh, you asked if, how the Chinese managed to con us, in effect, for such a long time. And I think everything that, uh, that has been said before, I completely agree with. But I think there's something far more fundamental. And that is deep down in the psychology of the United States is a deeply liberal disposition that looks at the world in ways that not everyone in the international community looks at the world. So we think of order as essentially a creation where if people are gaining from, why would they want to disturb it, right? And that is, there's almost an innocence sometimes in the United States about the way we think of the world around us. We imagine that people are sort of stronger or more pale reflections of ourselves. And then we are repeatedly surprised when we discover that there are agents and entities in the international system that one, are not like us, don't share our goals, don't share our interests, and are willing to surprise us repeatedly. What I find interesting is that even when surprised, and we've been surprised as far as I can remember, uh, since at least 1914, right? <laughs> we still relapse into the expectation that next time will be different. That somehow, you know, the lesson has been learned by would-be anti-status quo powers. And if they do something crazy, they will invoke the righteous indignation of the United States, and therefore they will never do it. I'm still waiting. <laughs> so we're not through the looking glass yet. Um, yeah. OK, I'd like to turn to uh, the audience uh, here in the front row. <laughs> we have the microphone coming. Don't fall. Safety first. Thanks. I'm Rana in Bowdoin um, with the Strauss Center. I wanted to follow Josh's example of asking a multi-part question. So on the domestic front, can you speak to Xi's popularity at home? Um, he's had this anti-corruption drive, which by some accounts resonates with the public. He's had a more assertive uh, foreign policy. Does this speak to Chinese nationalism, um, and at the same time, we see him cl clamping down very hard on human rights. So is this born out of weakness at home? And then on foreign policy, are we entering a new era in terms of foreign policy? Those of us who have spent years studying Chinese foreign policy have seen 
even if we have seen um, some, at times, assertive behavior, we've usually seen ways to restrain Chinese behavior, uh, concern about image, um, and especially seeing China in the UN being rather cautious. Are we, are those of us who have spent all that time now have wasted those years? Because aside from Xi, who has a more assertive foreign policy, for years we've been hearing debate or bubbling about within the Chinese community, within the elite foreign policy community about China's rise and taking a more assertive role in the world. Thank you. <clears throat> Can I give it a try? Yeah. Okay, on, on the popularity of Xi, um, which is a very interesting question. It, it depends which groups in China you ask. The Chinese elite today is shocked by his behavior. Frankly, if you get them aside, they'll say, he has, he has shaken us to the core. And one of the problems that he's created is that you all know that the Chinese economy has been slowing because of a change, overcapacity, and an attempt to change from uh, investment-led to consumer-led. But there's another problem that he's created in that with the anti-corruption campaign, no official wants to give out any loans to anybody anymore for fear that they will be accused of doing something bad with the money. So while there has been that change, he has also uh, affected economic growth in China. Now, the public is very pleased with what he's done uh, in general because he has gone after something that has really bothered them. They have been preyed on by officialdom. They have had to pay bribes. Every promotion in the Chinese military, we now understand, took a bribe for many, many years. And the people were tired of this. They were tired of a leading group in the government that was predatory. And so that has been popular. His difficulty, though, is this popularity will wane if the Chinese economy slows too far because there is the implied in the uh, economic reforms of Deng Xiaoping, and it has been a tenant ever since the beginning of the reform era, that we will allow the government to make policy. We won't get involved in politics, but the government in turn will create an environment in which our incomes and our livelihood continues to, to go up. So, there's some danger in what he's doing. Uh, he calls this the new normal, and he, he's hoping for a new normal that is around 7% growth a year. There are a lot of economists who are doubting that right now. And so we'll, so we'll have to see whether this popularity is maintained or whether he starts to hit some problems because of, of the economic situation. I think another important aspect to, to contemplate is the the press and how the press is managed in China and how that feeds into Xi's relatively rel perception of his uh, popularity. I've, I've said to my Chinese counterparts, I said, I wish I was in your position. I said, you have a press that you tell them what to say, they say it to you, and then you believe it. Uh, so that's a pretty nice position to be in. And so to the degree that, uh, that the Chinese people believe what they're told to believe about Xi, and to the degree that we believe what the Chinese press tell us to believe about Xi must be a consideration. Uh, I did want to, just on the second point you made about um, sort of can we still get China to, in other words, can we shape Chinese behavior? I think there are places in which we are able still to shape their behavior. They want to be in on the consensus on many different things in the world situation. Um, we, we have gotten them to move, as I said, on climate change. Uh, we, I think, will shape their behavior some with the TPP, because I think they will now have to move in, a, in, in certain directions in order to stay within sort of the new economic order in East Asia. So I, I, don't, want to, I, I don't want to leave you with the impression that all is lost on China. I think 
Also, I think that she, as a, as a new leader, has made some mistakes, and I think that if we sustain our involvement in East Asia, work with our allies in East Asia, we can shape his behavior. Because unlike the Russians, they need us. They need the markets. You buy a billion dollars a day worth of Chinese goods. That is important to them. That's important to Chinese stability. And so there, we do have some levers in this, this situation. Josh, being uh, somewhere between 25 and 35 years older than uh, all of those speaking, but therefore having watched this part of the world for a very long time, I remember the Japanese growth that was close to this percentage for a very long time. And then suddenly the property bubble burst and they went into the sustained ongoing challenges. And as I watch China, I worry, given the size of the local debt and all the rest, I can still print paper. But I, I see some troubling signs that they could repeat the Japanese model. And I would urge that may be a bigger problem for us than less, because that certainly will cause political instability inside. I'm probably subject to part of that perceptions management that's been discussed. But I'd, Three years ago, uh, I was hearing, particularly from the PLA side, but many of the others, U.S. is a declining power. We're the rising power. We're going to pass you by. I've not heard that this year mm -hmm. in my interactions at all as they look at where they are and begin to recalibrate. Um, and finally, I heard criticisms of Xi this past June for the first time inside the old families in the process. Uh, uncertainty. They keep bringing up succession. Well, why should he tell anybody what his plans are until he has to in 2017 when five of the seven standing committee members have to retire in the process? And by the way, Reactions? well, they don't have to retire. Um, this is an informal rule of, it's an unwritten rule of the Chinese Communist Party in recent years. And there are a lot of people who say, why would she have um, the head of the corruption, uh, Wang Jishan, leave? This guy has been so effective for him, he needs him to remain, and even though he has passed the age standard. Unless he's done, yeah, done but that seems unlikely. Um, but. I think that um, one of the things that scares these families is there has been stability in the Chinese system for the last few years because of the consensual nature of the leadership. He's, he's disrupted that. And he's, he's gone after people who were aligned with some of the other networks within the leadership. And so I think some of what you're hearing is, is the result of a little bit of are we going back to a strongman leader? And Chairman Mao was a strongman leader and didn't turn out so well. So I do think there, there is some concern about where he's headed. Can I take a crack at that? Yeah. I agree with you that there are structural weaknesses in China that are very serious, which is why I think the point that Dennis made earlier, that they are eminently deterrable and their policy can be shaped, is extremely important because you don't want to end up with the fatalism that somehow there is an open-ended march for which there's no solution. But they have three advantages in my judgment. First, there is a recognition of their problems and actually a honesty uh, that I find actually quite interesting in an otherwise authoritarian polity. So you read the analyses that come out of China about their economic problems, and they could have been written at the University of Chicago. I mean, this is, you know, people who are not sort of uh, gliding over the difficulties. And I think that's a big asset. Second, there is a leadership, everything about Xi notwithstanding, that is quite determined to sort of preserve China's place in the sun. Uh, these are guys who care seriously about comprehensive national power. And they see the prospect of greatness as being within grasp. So will they make mistakes? Yes, they're eminently capable of making mistakes. But it's not as if they're oblivious 
to the need to make smart decisions. And third, they have resources. So at least in the near term, they can throw resources at problems. Now, the, the obvious uh, retort, which I would admit, is that it's not a self-sustaining strategy over the secular period, right? But in the long run, we're all dead. So the question from the leadership's point of view is, if I can get over the most problematic crises on the horizon, then maybe I'm not doing too badly. Make it through the short term to get to the long term. Uh, Randy, did you have a comment on this question? Well, just very quickly, I think the I, I agree with the parallels with Japan. Um, difference being, when the real estate bubble popped there, we had a blur of six or seven Japanese prime ministers and governments, and then things sort of stabilized. In the case of China, we might have something far, far more chaotic. And as others have observed, um, it's that kind of catastrophic failure is not in our interest. What I can't quite square in my own mind, though, is uh, how do we root for and try to support and engender success of the Chinese people and the country and not root for and try to sustain uh, the Communist Party of China? Uh, we used to talk about that. Um, even in the Clinton administration, the policy was peaceful evolution. And it was no secret what we were talking about in terms of what we were evolving from and to. And it, we, we seem to think, uh, and, and maybe it's subjective truth, there's, there's no alternative for, as far as the eye can see, f other than the success of China equals the su success of the Communist Party. That's, that sits pretty uncomfortably with me. Um, China certainly, and the Communist Party has certainly gone to school on what happened in the former Soviet Union, and they talk about it and write about it. Economic reform, fine. Political reform, absolutely not, and a heavier hand. And so... Uh, I'm just saying I can't square that quite quite yet. Um, I think we need some way to get beyond uh, having our strategy so closely tied to the success of the Communist Party because ultimately I think that traps us in the kind of competition that's going to be very costly and very uh, uh, very challenging over the long term. Excellent. Wow, so, so many questions here. I want to get a student. Uh, there we are. Any students here? Ah. Student okay. up at the back. Okay, a student from China. Hi, thank you. Thank you for all the panelists to be here. Um, my name is Zeilun Chen. I'm an international uh, studies, uh, international relations and global studies major. Uh, my question is going off to, uh, uh, going off of Mr. Miller. Uh, he mentioned Xi Jinping, uh, the, the leader of the current fifth generation of leadership, um, you know, in my last 30 years, but eventually Xi Jinping will be gone. And the question now is then, who will lead the sixth generation of leadership? Uh, these are men that are my father's age, born in 1962, 1963, and went through the Cultural Revolution. And they have a very different mindset in terms of what the party stands for and what the party should be, as opposed to the past generations, which are, you know, like Xi Jinping, whose father's a founding member of the Communist Party, uh, Bo Xilai, whose father was Bo Yibo, one of the founding members of the Communist Party. I mean, these are the new generation, like the current party chief in Guangdong, uh, Hu Chunhua, these are people who work their self up in the party and they have basically, they don't have any uh, privileges because of who their father were and because of, you know, their, any extension to uh, early party affiliation. So just want to hear some of the panel's thoughts about the sixth generation. Thank you. Okay. Um, you know, hope springs eternal. <laughs> and with, with each generation of Chinese leaders, and I'm sure uh, Mr. Inman will agree with me, we always say, well, this is the generation that's going to be something new, something different. Um, and and we've, we've been a bit disappointed in this process. So I'm, I'm a little leery of, 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 of hoping that the next Chinese leader is something different. Um, it's possible. It is, you make a very good point that the, far, the farther you get from the revolutionary generation, the less resonance some of this has. I mean, in some ways, there are two Chinas today, and I think you know this as well as I do. There's the party China, and then there's an entrepreneurial China. And the two are different as night and day in many ways. Um, so if, if you could get a leader who comes from that entrepreneurial China, 
um, you know, I think we'd be in a better place. Um, the difficulty is that Xi Jinping is going to choose somebody from within um, his circle, um, whether, you know, and, and, and so I'm not sure we're going to see that very soon. But I am hopeful. There is a lot of change in China. There are a lot of new thinkers in China below the elite level, below the, or outside of the Chinese Communist Party. So I, I'm always hopeful that, that the future will bring something different. American optimism. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And naivety, I might add. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Professor Busby. Um, thanks much. I'm uh, Josh Busby from the LBJ School, professor there. In terms of uh, managing a more complex global agenda, I'd be curious how can we balance the tactical challenges posed by the Middle East and the long-run challenge of China. If, if Dr. Tellis is right, we need to marshal our resources to prepare for China's rise, um, and yet uh, uh, another land war in the Middle East uh, will likely be expensive and divert our attention to be able to pay attention to Asia. So I'd be curious about your response to that. How do we balance these competing interests, claims? <laughs> if I had the answer to that question, I'd make a lot of money. Um, I, I don't think there's a canned answer. But I think what we, we need to keep in mind two things. One, there is uh, something called overinvesting in dealing with one problem to the neglect of all others. And if we don't maintain our policy equilibrium and recognize that we've got to deal both with the short game and the long game, uh, you can end up in a lot of trouble. So I think part of it is simply consciousness that you don't want to be over-leveraged by throwing all your resources and dealing at one problem. I mean, beyond that, it's simply a question then of how you sort of apportion resources uh, and so on and so forth. Obviously, if uh, ISIL represents a clear danger to our security today, we have to put the resources to deal with it. But there are multiple solutions to that problem. That is, we don't have to imagine that defeating ISIS requires another major land war with you know, tens of thousands of American troops and so on and so forth. I think our planners and our military are creative enough to be able to find solutions to defeat this within the limits of our capacity. So that's the first point I'd like to make. The second point I'd like to make is a broader point. And it has to do with the whole question of US-China competition. There has never been a case in history where a um, established power has lost its position at the pinnacle of the international system because it has actually been defeated in war by a rising power. No, no case. There are numerous instances, though, where established powers have lost their position because they so expended themselves in some campaigns that the, they opened the door for bystanders to then take their place. The great example is actually Great Britain against Germany uh, in the early 20th century. And so my concern, and this goes back to attempting to answer Admiral McRaven, is uh, we definitely need to defeat ISIL. But let's not presume that defeating ISIL requires us to commit so many resources that we're simply incapable of managing the others. And I think at the end of the day, the United States of America can fight three campaigns as long as we are smart and as long as we do it wisely. Yeah, I, I, would, I, would, I would second that in, really in, uh, in spades. Uh, I, I believe I agree with the chancellor. I think that that this uh, war on terrorism will be with us forever. Um, as I told someone last night, when I was eight years old, the population of the world was three billion people. I, I turned 61 last month, and now the population of the world is 7.5 billion people. It'll be 10 billion people by the middle of this century, assuming nothing bad happens. So. Uh, uh, that's going to create a lot of people that are competing for a lot of different space and a lot of different ideologies. So you're going to have terrorism. 
So we have to have a continuous build a capability to maintain our country safe, our livelihood safe against terrorism. And we have to be able to do that continuously. Now, but I don't think that in the larger construct of, of strategic challenges that we have, that terrorism will fundamentally, could fundamentally shift the, the strategic poles of the globe. I think it's just gonna annoy us and terrify us, but it's not gonna do this to the globe. What could do that to the globe has been done in history before is where you have a major power dispute where one becomes preeminent over another with a vastly different ideology. And we don't want that to be uh, anybody but the United States to be in the tweaking mode on that. So I think to answer your question, there was a good recognition of this by this administration back in 2012 when they signed out the, the rebalance the Asia Pacific document. It's about 14 pages. It's not a long read. If you haven't ever read it, you should. It just lays out exactly what kind of how we're going to go after it. But it was, it is a, a, not about just the military either. The military is only a side part of it. It's about how does the U.S. reorient it, its diplomatic, its economic, its political, its social, its energy policies, all these things to recognize that our children, our grandchildren's livelihood re rely on what's going to happen in Asia in the 21st century. And if we're not there, you might have this. We've got about 10 minutes left, so what I'd like to do is take two questions and group them together uh, to uh, see if we can't sneak another question into the mix here. Um, I see a, a student hand right there. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll try to keep these two relatively short and we get more in. Um, I wanted to say thanks for speaking to us about all of these different issues, but uh, I had a question specifically about the cyber issue. Um, I know that a lot of attention was paid to the agreement uh, between Obama and Xi recently, um, but I wanted to know your perspectives on whether that is something that the Chinese government has both the will and ability to do something about, or if that's more of just kind of a, a political statement. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, one more. Uh, I guess this uh, young lady sitting next to you, or right there. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a question? Yeah. Oh, you didn't. Okay. I'm sorry. Dr. Yeah. Eisenman. Right, right here. Oh. Dr. Eisenman. Okay. Right, right here. Oh. Can't see me. Oh, yes, there you yeah. go. Yeah. Uh, so a while ago when you, you were talking about all the different aspects of U.S.-Chinese foreign policy or U.S. foreign policy towards China, uh, Dr. Tellis mentioned of how new non-traditional partners in Asia like India and Vietnam could be uh, more useful to U.S. foreign policy and to be kind of used to ward off the Chinese threat. But is there, are there any concrete initiatives that U.S. has with India or with Vietnam that they are pursuing in, in this regard? Great. Thank you. Um, Admiral, would you like to start us off again? Well, the, the answer to that is yes. Um, I think that that first of all, the ASEAN uh, countries uh, uh, and the ASEAN uh, structure, even though it is not uh, a model of any kind of security architecture at this stage, it certainly has been a, a beneficial voice and what a growing voice in what happens in Southeast Asia, particularly as it relates to how you deal with or may shape a more aggressive China. So I don't think we should give up on ASEAN. We should support it. I think that you'll see that that probably in the coming months that we will, as a country, will improve our relationship with ASEAN, will elevate it to a, in a, to a strategic level of a, a greater preeminence. It's not gonna solve all the problems, but it, but it is good. And certainly some of the, what I observed, I mean, I, I would have never guessed that, that when I came in the Navy, we were at war in Vietnam, and, and then when I went to Vietnam as a, as a PACOM commander, that we have a, a significant number of security uh, in things that are in common with each other. And certainly uh, that type of activity with Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, the ASEAN countries, uh, even countries like Mongolia. I mean, if, if, you, if, if there's any Chinese people here, I'm, I apologize for saying this, but most countries in Asia want to be more like the U.S. than they want to be like China in every regard. And so uh, if we, as long as we have that going for us, I think that we have the opportunity around the periphery. And the rebalance does that. I mean, the rebalance is really a long-term look at how do you position yourself. It's not just about China. China is kind of on the, 
kind of moves around inside this architecture and it, and it hopefully will help shape China. But it includes a growing number of uh, improved alliances that we have already and a growing number of strategic partnerships, including places like Vietnam, Malaysia, Laos, pick one. Thank you. Um, just along those same lines, another way I've heard people put it, um, China's soft power is really bad. And if you take North Korea out of the equation, China's best relationship in Asia is probably not as good as our worst. Um, and I'd include Myanmar, I'd include Cambodia. Uh, so it's not all doom and gloom. More, more countries admire and aspire to what we're doing. Um, maybe a, a quick word on cyber. Um, I, I'm very skeptical of this agreement, and I think we already have evidence that it's not being honored. And I, I, I didn't quite agree with what you said earlier, Dennis, which would probably be the only thing I didn't agree in your excellent presentation. You said it was implicit acknowledgement by the Chinese part about these activities. Actually, what I heard them say is, we've never done that before, we've not, we're not involved in that at all, and by the way, we won't do it again now that we've agreed to it. <laughs> So that, there, that, that's as close as the Chinese so there, get. To, but uh, but the pro, but the problem with that, <laughs> this incongruous quality to that statement, is that they're going to keep on doing what they're doing, and that is what they're doing. And we've already collected enough data to say that the pace and scope hasn't changed at all. And and another reason I'm pretty skeptical is, I don't know that everybody understands quite what we're up against here. This is not a bunch of uh, Chinese uh, teenagers in hoodies sitting in an internet cafes and, and creating mischief. This is the three PLA, which is pre predominantly the three PLA, which is the rough equivalent of our NSA with over 100,000 people in, in their headquarter facility alone with at least 12 operational bureaus supported by technical reconnaissance bureaus in all their military regions and all their services. And it is an extremely aggressive espionage effort. I think our problem is Chinese espionage. It's not cyber. I, I, I'm a little confused by, you know, this strategy of let's go out and try to seek agreement on norms. All right. We, you know, we, intelligence in our country is a very honorable business. And, you know, we don't do tawdry things like steal economic secrets, and let's try to get them to embrace that norm, and, and let's focus only on the modality of cyber. You know, if you send a Chinese reporter in and steal some IP, I guess, I guess we're not that upset about that. But we're, it's almost as if we're trying to professionalize the intelligence services of the Chinese, and that's our goal here, which I think is odd. Um, uh, I, I think we have an espionage problem, not necessarily a cyber problem. But, but there it is. And so they've got this huge apparatus, which I think it, that's not so easy to just turn the, to switch on and off. And just one, you, you said, do they ha, does he have the, the will or the ability? I think he lacks the will. And I, I have some question about the ability, because if you look at 3PLA uh, and you look particularly at uh, Second uh, Department, which is where the five PLA officers were indicted, uh, a very interesting thing about that organization, a lot of those guys have horizontal reporting relationships or they have party positions in Shanghai in the prefecture uh, party structure and they have relationships with SOEs and many SOEs. And it turns out that this is not just an espionage effort, it's a criminal enterprise in a lot of cases. And so the PLA and this part of the PLA not only sees this a threat to their mission, you know, they think they're doing good work out there spying for for, I was going to say God and country. I guess they're still officially an atheist country, for country at least. But this is a very profitable activity for general, senior colonels, and so forth. So mm, I'm pretty skeptical. I am too. And, and so you try to have dialogue with them, and you say, well, you know, it's okay if you spy on each other, military to military. We do that. For you. But, but, but you can't take internet intellectual properties. And it's odd because we're trying to – you're sitting there in front of uh, – a, you know, authoritarian bureaucracy communists who, in trying to impress a Judeo-Christian morality perspective on what they do, and they go, look, it's good for China. If it's good for China, then we do it. And you ought to be smart enough to stop us if, that's, if you're worried about it. Dr. Pellis, do you want to... Well, I'll just address the young lady's question about India and Vietnam. I, I agree with uh, Admiral Locklear completely. You have to work with the instruments you have. And as long as there are regional institutions, we should be working with those regional institutions, irrespective of what we 
genuinely judge to be their effectiveness. But there are two things I think that uh, we are advantaged by. First is there is a terrific demand throughout Asia for an American presence. So it's not as if that we have to go in there and force ourselves on our Asian neighbors. They want us there. So you're pushing on an open door. So the challenge for us is how do we be creative in building and forging relationships given that they see partnering with the US to be in their interest, right? The second thing I would say is if we are smart, the one thing we do not want to do is force the Asian states to make unpalatable choices between China and the United States. There may come issues on which you want the Asian states to choose, but as a general principle of diplomacy, we do not want to confront these states with a choice that says, choose China, choose us. We should be encouraging them to have the best possible political relationship they can with China. What we should be doing is simply seeking to have a bilateral relationship with each of these countries that provides more and is better. Better because it really speaks to their own true aspirations for security and autonomy. And the advantage we have because we are so far away is that we can actually do it with some credibility because the Chinese are closer than we are and they will be the natural magnet for the region's anxieties in any case. Well, I want to thank the panel for an excellent discussion. Uh, we're going to take a bit of a break.